In this episode, Ryan and I talk about how trying to eliminate the base premium merely distorts policy growth values and actually robs future momentum from that policy, all for a temporary high of feeling like you've got one over on the man. We had fun and hope you enjoy listening. Okay, welcome to the Bank with Life podcast. I'm your host, James Nethery. I'm your co-host, Ryan Griggs. And, you know, thanks for listening in. We've had quite the fun for the previous 10, 15 minutes just talking about life in general. Well, I really enjoyed your prior episode, the two-part deal you did with Mike and Lori. I thought they were very cool. Mike, man, he's got some energy. Sprinkle some capital on him and good things are going to happen, huh? I mean, on both of them, I get they're a team. Lori's very, very elegant and sophisticated, I thought. Yes. No, they're cool people. I appreciate her comment about entrepreneurship and how things go here versus how it happens in Sweden, for instance, where I think it was their son-in-law who was, mm-hmm. at the time, was still living there. Um, but really cool. And I was kind of tearing up, you know, to talk about adopting kids. I'm like, dang, man. Sprinkle some capital on those people. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Anyway, that was very good. Good job. I'm glad you listened to it. Thank you. I'm glad you listened to it on your way down. I have not listened to it. Um, well, I, you were here for the first, you know, actual part of it. So, yeah, I got that part. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's been a minute though. Um, but I love them. They're salt of the earth people. They're they're doers. They get it done. Yeah. They're getting it done. They're doing it. So, what does that mean, James? They're doing what they want to do and how they want to do it and improving along the way. Well, I always enjoy. I mean, someone made a comment about it, and it's I can we continually come back to it, and it's the subject of capital and opportunity intertwines with it but you know how should i use how should i use utilize use my policy or policies yeah well you know you're you're quite the uh, educated and knowledgeable young man why don't you tell them (laughs) (laughs) stop it no we're making joke of uh, making i'm making fun a bit because it's a very common question and there's just my my response it's lighthearted always but it's like how could I know? Go listen to Mike and Lori talk about what they're doing and the nature of that deal that he put together to acquire that, what was it, 70 acres? I mean, substantial property and all the different things they're doing. There's really no one thing they're doing with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then go into the particular, like the specifics of that deal, like how he structured it. Five year, you know, purchasing property from the seller. 1.5 million originally 20 percent down 300 grand then 400 down balloon payment after the five years no payments for the first two years you know spreads out tax liability he talked about the trade-off between time and money and they've got the money to then they the counterparty had the time and they could exchange and it all worked out um who could have ever told Mike and Lori, that that's what they should go do with their policies. Right. There's no way. There's, I mean, I could be, I'm like a little flipping about it, but there's just no way. There's no way. Uh, I mean, in talking with clients, <clears throat> maybe a policy goes, in, and this has happened. I'll have policies in force. I'll have ongoing conversations with these clients. I'll learn something about them after the fact that I didn't know. Absolutely. When the policy first went in force, no question. And so, yeah. Yeah. it's like I have no, I don't know, man. I don't I don't know what you should be doing with your capital. I don't know what your human potential looks like, um, and it, probably neither do you. But that that's okay. Look, if to my mind, <laughs> it would it would be uh, unfortunate if like. I could fully understand my own potential. Like if I could just, mm. if I could just know it right now, I don't know. I, I would hope that maybe there's a possibility that things should be beyond what I could imagine. Even if I did sit down and try to, you know, imagine well, all the things that could happen. It's like great example is my own experience. I mean, if you had told me seven years ago when I'm sitting in a classroom that I'd be it, you know, sitting across from you talking about life insurance, uh, I would have thought that was crazy. You know, and if I had asked somebody back then, you know, hey, what should I be doing with my career? What should I be doing with, you know, how I'm going to make money and what am I? 
And someone said, well, what you need to do is go to Texas <laughs> and you need to, well, first you need to meet this 85, I think he was at the time, year old gentleman. Uh, and, and then you need to go to Texas. Uh, you need to really be committed to becoming a professor, but then let all that fail. And then go to, it's like, I would never, like, you know, I would never have I would that pay foresight. for the professor at that time. And I have no disparagement to the professor, the, the uh, profession. I would pay to hear the response to a young man <laughs> who says, ask the professor, hey, what should I do with my time and my capital? Yeah. Um, you know, that that there's a there's a lot there. You know, like I said, I appreciate you listening to Mike and Lori. Any episode, every episode, I appreciate every listener. But um, that, y- you know, they, they did what they do. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, she and, – and, I think that you're no different. I'm no different. Whatever People are going to think that what you just said is like, oh, filler. But no, you really mean that they're doing something that they knew about. Absolutely. That's exactly where I'm going. Yeah. Did they know that they were going to, uh, you know, run across a vineyard that the uh, owner, the original owner, the father graduated? No. How could they know? The future is unknown. The, and, and that's so simple, too. And I know I get... I uh, I get uh, poked a uh, little fun at every now and then because you know some of the things I say is too simple, but it is what it is. The future is unknown. You know that. You knew that before I said that. But the future is unknown. How did? How could they have possibly known that a vineyard was going to become available? Mm-hmm. And how could they possibly have known the? details or the circumstances in which it became available yeah. but you know because they're entrepreneurs anyway um, they have been saving and building capital and they're practicing capitalism and then the opportunity comes and I think I don't know how long you know I met them six they became a client three to six months prior to that and he he uh, called me out of the blue. I think it was on a Saturday, and he's like, "Hey, James, you got a minute? And he, Do you know anything about wineries?" I'm like, "No, no, I don't." But I have clients, at, you know, a couple of clients that own wineries. Anyway, who could know? They can't know. The future is unknown. But they are doing something that they know about, and whatever it is you're doing, and which will be the most profitable profitable thing that you can do in my opinion and the second most profitable thing will be financing what you do mm-hmm. it's it's really not complicated but um the idea i love the idea that 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 you know you are gonna tell somebody what they should do yeah. with their money and don't get me wrong i mean so, i understand that people <laughs> like the examples you know they're illumin- they're illuminating inspiring exciting I mean, I really enjoyed the episode. Don't get me wrong. It's like, I understand there's value in that and people want more of that. But it's also the case that like what you're doing is also enough. And don't get me wrong. Like, I understand there's always room for improvement and everybody can get better and I get that. But when I say what you're doing is enough, you know, if it's the case that you're spending less than you're making, there's an accumulation of capital going on somewhere. And it may not happen regularly over time, so you may not see things build up because as happens with cash, we save cash, we spend it, it goes down. I get that. But for intervals, certain time periods between major expenses, if you're making more than you're spending, there is at least a period of capitalization somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of whether or not you own that. That, It's really that simple to me when you... Boil it all down. All the policy design, company questions, company selection, types of term writers. You were talking earlier about how people overcomplicate things before we turned on cameras. And I don't think you know. I said overcomplicate, did I? No, you didn't. You said too technical. <clears throat> they, yeah, we get lost get in the weeds technical. and the technicalities. Yeah. yeah. Which there's a lot of weeds to get lost in. Because and there's a lot of help to drag you out into the weeds to yeah. get lost and beat to death. Yeah. And, yeah. No. Which kind of tied into the conversation that that, yeah. that we were having. One thing that resonated after <clears throat> an unusual start to the year, I feel like last year and year before, at the beginning of the year, things were kind of slow, like recover from the holidays type thing. Mm-hmm. That was not the case this year. It's been, we 
got right back on the grind this year, which is good. I'm thankful. Um, but one thing that came up during this week that uh, it was a client call, questions about policy design, relatively new to IBC, and same thing as always, 1090, you know. Maximum Always, cash huh? value as early as possible. Yeah. And I had a really unique case where I think I mentioned this guy, the client. And by the way, this happens sometimes. People, U.S. citizens living abroad, and they come to the U.S. because you got to be in the U.S. to apply and go through underwriting and then take delivery. Can't come to the U.S. just to buy life insurance. Yeah. Non insurance reasons. Okay. Yeah. So, that, but you know, a client, this client happens to live in Romania, visiting family um, in Nevada. And Policy structure, premium structure, premium proportionality type conversation. You know, and I had a similar one with another client who's in the U.S. And I don't know why. Maybe it was when I was driving or in the shower or something. But it just occurred to me. It's like, you know, there is nothing special. You're not getting anything new. And you've said this before. It was one of the first things I heard when I first got into the business is that there's no deals in life insurance. You're not going to like... <laughs> You're gonna have a life insurance company, sure. Yeah, a hundred plus year old. Some of these companies, 150 plus year old companies. You know, you're gonna an agent, a marketer, someone who is not a math person, someone who's not at the home office for a reason, who's not an actuary for a reason. That person is gonna just because. Oh, you know, here we'll just take this part of the premium, put it down, take the other one, put it up, and huh, you're gonna get something special you know we're gonna wringle out some special value that other people aren't gonna get it's like no no it's just all trade-offs <laughs> you know it's it you want something special or different up front okay you're gonna give up something somewhere else you know if you want longevity you want mech resilience you want the a, a very conservative long-term you know type of contractual capacity that allows you to do that the things that nelson taught <clears throat> there's going to be trade-offs. It's going to mean you're not going to maximize. You're not going to have maximum cash value day one relative to premium. Uh, relative to a 1090, you're going to have maximum cash value in day one relative to the stability of the policy that you. Yes, you control. still have it, and then it's okay. So uh, this is another problem, right? You say, okay, well, there's different ways of going about things. There's these yeah. trade-offs, one way or the other, and then that can get taken too far. Oh, if I don't do 1090, then I don't have any liquidity. All these Nelson Nash guys are telling me I got to wait seven, ten, twenty-five. Enter the number, number of years before I can do anything. And where do they? Where do they get those numbers? You know, I, and I don't know either. I shouldn't ask questions. Well, I do know the answer to that question, so I shouldn't ask it. They pick it out of thin air, whatever fits into their presentation. Right. You know, a, I don't, don't, don't look at this because you can't do that for, you can't do anything over there for seven years, four years, whatever. Right. Pick the number that makes sense in your presentation. Yeah. Yeah. And people will pull out little lines, very common with Nelson's book, pull out little lines out of context. And just say, oh, you know, he'll, he says it takes 20 to 25 years to, for you to finance everything you need. Oh, I got to wait 20 to 20. You know, who wants? <laughs> no. You know, you have cash value as soon as you have PUA premium. You have PUA premium as soon as you have a policy and you pay the premium. You know, yeah. and that's true regardless of the structure. I think most but, of the – well, go ahead. Keep well, it's, it's not the case that – it's an either or. It's not a mutually exclusive type thing. It's not like you have no liquidity early on if you go with a long term oriented type structure that uh, of the sort that I think follows from what Nelson teaches. Um, but if you do, if you go the other route and you try to you do try to squeeze out, maximize liquidity early on. You had a great point. I, you and I, I have been having conversations with a particular company recently. And I had some conversations about modified endowment contracts and you and I talked and we were talking about premium design all before we came on the podcast, of course. But uh, one of these individuals who works at one of these companies had a great point, uh, you know, because he's like, look, our com this company, we not, we're not interested in 1090. And I'm like, that's very interesting that you say that. Why would you, a 45 or however many year veteran of the life insurance industry who works in the home office at one of these companies and understands the product better than obviously anybody else on the call. Uh, May why, know something, huh? Why would you say that? <laughs> yeah, like what, I'm, and I and I really just said, I was kind of smiling because, and he was very, very complimentary. He watched previous talks that attended the Nelson Nash Institute think tank and seen me speak. And so he's very complimentary. And he, so he had done some background and kind of knew where I was coming from. Um, and so I was smiling when I asked the question and he just said, well, look, you know, the industry in general, he didn't want to talk about the company in particular. He's like, the industry in general doesn't want to give, you know, 
a hundred percent liquidity or ninety percent li- maximum liquidity, you know, an extension of a of cash value, which is essentially a loan offer. You know, you're uh, telling people, look, if you want a loan, you can exercise this it's contractual a provision. Loan offer, yeah, yeah. And so th- that's a liability. Like they have that's liquidity they have to account for. What? Yeah. And so they don't want to offer that maximum of sort of perverse disproportionate amount of liquidity and pay a commission to a life insurance agent and endure the nature of that business. And the meaning it's relative impersistence. It's likely the likeliness that it's that business is not going to stay on the books. And then you make a great point. He's like so that was this what this guy said, you know. And that's absolutely part that no question. All part of Complete it. Complete agreement. You know? uh, but then you had a great your way of putting it, and I, I think I said this to you on the phone at the time, but and I don't know why it just hit with me. He's like, it's just not good business. It's not good business. And quite literally, it doesn't those policies don't those policies relative to a more traditional Nelson Nash style, long-term type, IBC, bona fide IBC, hard line approach, they don't last as long. And no one ever talks about persistence. None of these, you know, no, none of these uh, gamified marketing social media people make any of their clickbait videos about persistence, do they? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's even more to that. <clears throat> I mean, well, it's just not a, good business, no d- question. And yeah. so just to be clear, persistence is a technical term in the business uh, with respect to a life insurance agent's production, meaning the policies that he or she has put in force or sold, how many of those are still up and running? That's how persistent that percentage is the persistency percentage. And how long are they going to be persistent? Then when, when does a life insurance company become profitable on a single policy? Do you think the actuaries, the engineers, put the policies together? Right. Does the pricing, you know, all, all of the mortality. It prices life insurance, you know, you got to price in commissions, you got to price in, you know, the, the expected rate of returns and where they're going to put the money and the uh, claims ratio and the persistency ratios. All, all of those are very important components in pricing life insurance. And so, how long does a company have to have a, it, you know, it actually costs a life insurance company to put money on the books. They have to have uh, cash or cash equivalents to all the claims that they are guaranteeing. They have to have access, you know, to that liquidity. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot there, not to get over overly technical, but it, it's just not that big of a deal either. There's only so many pennies in a dollar, right? So, if... If I'm going to, and you look at Big Blue, you know, out there, the first of last year, the very first memo that uh, that they put out is like, oh, well, we don't do anything with infinite banking, the infinite banking concept. Well, they didn't, they didn't name the infinite banking concept bank on yourself, be your own bank, all of these other names, but they specifically did not write about the infinite banking concept, the trademarked infinite bank concept. And I wonder why. Anyway, that's a side point. Um they don't like 9010, one of the big, quote unquote, big four companies, right? Well, if you look at their particular case, in addition to paying the commission, you have to have the reserve set aside as a life insurance company, liquid, uh, you know, uh, cash, cash equivalents. Um, all of the costs that it takes a life insurance company uh, to put new business in force. And then you have this big company, and, and then in the life insurance industry, you know, they've beaten each other up. The agents, the salespeople have beaten each other up. The companies, you know, compete against each other on, on multiple points and fronts, but it always comes around to the dividend, right? Mm. And then it's, uh, okay, well, now if I have a high dividend, let's say I pay a 6% dividend, and there's in addition to the cost of putting that business on the books, they got to pay all the schmucks that do the click baby mm. model and stuff and then it's not persistent well, that's a good point and then there's a dividend paid. so yeah. then there's yeah. not it that that would never be profitable for the life insurance company ever ever because the persistency is low because of the thinking of 1090 and you continue that thinking out into actual activities it's just not gonna it's not gonna stay on the books but then whenever they are stuck in this 1950s world of dividends, right? Well, we pay the highest dividend. What's your dividend? What's your dividend? Our dividend. We went up. You held. You went down. Whatever. So they pay a 6% dividend in addition to all the cost. And then they charge a 5.75% loan rate 
on 90, and it's never really 90. They say 90, 10, but it's really never 90 because they just leave out it's that third component 10. cost, right? Yeah. But it sounds good, and it makes a great presentation. So the life insurance company is going to pay you. Oh, and then it's, well, are they direct or non-direct? Mm. Well, if they're a direct mm. recognition company, mm. then they can recover some of that in the reduced uh. dividend. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but if they're a non-direct life insurance company, they're going to pay a full dividend whether regardless mm. if a loan is outstanding or not so if they're paying a dividend and they can't lower the dividend because of who they are ah, oh, ah. we're big blue we can't lower the dividend mm. we're the big new york company we can't we're the <laughs> best you know nobody talks about us we're the quiet i'm not disparaging any particular company i i believe fully that it's mutual life insurance companies against the world when it comes to finances at the you and me level okay let me be very clear about that i respect them for on one level, uh, I don't respect them for just blasting out IBC and giving all these hucksters contracts. You got to stop. You got to run the rest of that down. They can't keep going. They can't. Okay, can't fuck. To, can't move the dividend because yeah, no, that's because I'm. Work. I am who I am. God right. can't lower my dividend. Yeah, captured by their own audience again. I'm going to talk about that. Moment, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but I'm gonna. Uh, so I'm not interested in these hucksters. I say hucksters. I don't even mean to be these less than. Uh, less than they could be. Okay, I mean, I really don't want to be ugly, and I'm not nothing in personal or disparagement. They don't know what the hell they're doing, and if they do, they should quit. Okay, all right. My opinion, and take it or leave it. Right? I mean, it's like I mean it in love. So I'm going to write a 1090 policy. We know the persistency is not going to be good, and we know that the company can't lower the dividend. And they're going to charge. So if I'm paying a 6% dividend and I'm charging you 5.75 on the loan rate, there's a spread compression that they can't take. Mm. All right. Now, I know interest rates are rising. They have been rising. In my humble opinion, they're going to continue to rise until the, the powers that be is like, oh, my gosh, we got to raise rates because we're going to kill our own debt. Okay. The cost of our own debt. Okay. Um, they're like, I can't lower the dividend. Mm -hmm. I can only charge you 5.75 on the interest rate. I'm already not profitable because of the persistency. Mm -hmm. Well, who And the product itself is not profitable anyway. Right. And any it, design and early here, on anyway. Yeah. yeah. And so here here's where I was going with that is is whenever there is spread compression to a life insurance company, it take they they put their money in bonds. Bonds. Okay? Bonds. And long-term, you know, high-grade corporate real estate, bonds of all durations. When there is a spread compression, and you're talking about billions of dollars, it takes them a long time to recover from that spread compression. Yeah, so there's a, there's a few. I love that. That was so, okay. Um on this audience are you going to map it out for us <laughs> uh, there's a lot there's so much I want to say um, okay there's this audience we talked last time about this audience capture idea right the agents captured by the I love that yeah uh, it's great and there's more to that right but you know uh, bigger number faster sooner whatever the title of that was and that's what the audience wants so the agents are going to give it so because the agents are captured by the public that just wants bigger faster better sooner right uh, well then the next layer is the the agents go to the companies to say, look, we need, you know, we got to meet that need. We got to, I'm going to be able to provide, I need a high early cash value. Oh, heck V. I need an acronym, something. Um, and so then the companies provide that. And then they get into the actual experience and come to find out how all that happens. And at everything you were just going through there, it, you listen to an agent. It just <laughs> dawned on me. It's like, you know, the 1090 thing <clears throat> is not just. A mech issue. No, there aren't just modified endowment, but and they tax exist. Status problem, right? Those are no, those are problems. Those are legitimate problems, and those do affect the design. But that isn't. There's a the modified, and and I've thought about this before because I would go down the 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 line of thought. You know, what if we didn't have modified endowment contract rules at all? You could go buy a single pay whole life, and it's no problem. You know, would would there be any base premium? as we think of it today uh, fair question paid yeah, yeah, anywhere yeah. ever yeah. by anybody yeah. could that even be an offering would that make sense long term and where i eventually came around to it's like no 
No. You can't. It, it's got to be the, the relationship, like on a PUA rider premium payment. You know, there's an expense charge. There's a administrative cost. There's a death benefit cost. A facilitation cost. You know, and there's an economic cost to a PUA premium. And the death benefit you get relative to the premium payment you make is fairly small, relative com- compared to a, a one year base premium compared to the initial death benefit. Absolutely. Right? Compared to that. They even got smaller since 2022. Yeah. yeah. My, okay. my, my point is, I think you have to have. This long-term type structure, you've got to have the initial illiquidity. The companies can't economically, they can't do everything you just talked about. They can't pay a dividend and pay the agent who placed the policy and services the client. And that's in the early years. Collect. They can't pay a freaking death benefit. There you go. Okay, they can't this guarantee where- with certainty, guarantee certainty. So you can't separate those. Uh, guarantee a future value. Yeah. They, it, it, so th- this is where this goes, right? Th- and this is how they mitigate, talking about trade offs, this is how they mitigate all of that uneconomic proposal, all that uneconomic proposal. You can't pay everybody. You want 100% liquidity and a dividend, and we're going to pay to do all that. Where that goes, the way the companies piecemeal patch that up is to mitigate the liability, <laughs> to build in ways. To reduce the freaking death benefit. We've talked about this from the day one. <clears throat> no question. That's a whole... We, we, could, we could spend the whole two hours on that. The, look, the concept of insurance. I'm a homeowner. You're an insurer. You're a fire insurer. I don't want my home to burn down. And I can't afford to rebuild the whole thing today. So let me pay you a premium to insure against that inability to replace my home because I don't have the money in case of a fire. I am paying you to receive and I'm offsetting that risk of loss. And and it for a premium, right? And and all the calculations, you know, take all the homes and all that law large numbers. The same thing in life insurance. It's a hundred percent guaranteed that we're all going to graduate. Mm-hmm. Man, if you're the one that's not, I might want to have a conversation <laughs> with you. <laughs> uh, no, I really don't. If you feel <laughs> yeah. that way, <laughs> you feel that way, yeah. <laughs> so it's just a matter of time. Yeah. When? Who knows? The future's unknown. But statistically, they can tell you exactly how many fifty-five-year-old men are going to die two years from now. Right? Okay. And my whole point here is that. I'm going to pay you for an eventual event. It's a guaranteed event. And so you've got to price all that together, which includes persistency, dividends, uh, the, the, the expected rate of return on guaranteed products, yeah. bonds, blah, 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 because the death benefit's guaranteed and the future cash value is guaranteed. All right. <clears throat> so, and then I want you to remain profitable for these 150 years. Not that I'm going to live that long, but my grandchildren might be here if I ever have any. Um, so I want you to be here, you know, if I'm going to do business with you. Then how conservative do you have to be? Mm. Right, Much more. And I'm, I'm as conservative as they come, you know me, but you've got to be uber conservative. Well, I'm okay with that if you're talking about my money or the money that I have a guaranteed contractual access to once I hand it over to you. Because once I pay a premium, it's not my money. Oh, but I have a guaranteed <laughs> contractual access to it. Well, who's backing up the guarantee? And that's important, right? We were talking about it all this long time, and I've got a guaranteed access, contractual access to that capital that I just paid you in the form of premium. Then I want you to be conservative. So from that point on, then they are going to mitigate every possible chance that they have, the possibility of something going wrong. Paying a claim too early, right? They didn't do underwriting. Um, um, I lied to them on the application. They didn't catch that through their 100-year-old developed process. Mm -hmm. And I smuggled in the back door, right? Uh, And then statistically, people die, what have you. Um, They're not going to do anything that helps the adverse selection against them. Right. They're not going to do anything to increase the risk that I just paid them to take. Yeah. Everything they do is going to mitigate. So, well, okay, James, now you're being all, okay, well, whatever, just follow me on this. With the PUA, right, you look and there's several structures of PUA. What ultimately happens to that death benefit in the future on all PUAs, blended PUAs? It goes blended, away. Blended PUAs. 
it goes away or decreases dramatically. The closer you get to natural mortality, whatever it is, statistically for all of us, each of us, the death benefit goes down. That's a hard win for the life insurance company. Yeah. Ah, oh, well, James. And that's how it gets paid. Okay, so, but no, here, the, because, uh, uh, okay. So, just looking at the cash value of a whole life policy on the base premium, right? We use a base, put all the riders on there. The cash value must equal the face amount at 120. We get that. No problem, right? You get that. We've talked about it many, many times. And then it pays a dividend. The dividend, if it's allocated to the PUA, purchases more death benefit. So, you have an increasing death benefit. And you, therefore, must have an increasing cash value because they have to equal it 120. Okay. Well, now let's just overweight the PUA. Let's stuff as much PUA premium compared to the base premium as we possibly can in the policy. And then we've talked about mech issues all the time. Then you have these other groups that say, oh, I've got an illustration and it doesn't mech for 30 years. Like, oh, my gosh, really? And you're selling your own self that stuff, man. You're a good salesman, but you're the only damn customer that believes it. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> I, and, and so here's where I want to go, and I want you to chew on this and and uh, give me some feedback. Okay. okay. Well, the dividend, or not the dividend, this is my best Southern hillbilly, and I'm from the South, and I love my heritage, okay? It's like, I can talk like you, but I lived in Spur, Texas for like three years, right? There's less than 300 people, 30, 300,000 cows, you know, we were outnumbered. Okay. <laughs> I mean, and I'm saying that because when I came back for full context, I married a beautiful girl from West Des Moines, Iowa. And when I came back, uh, that's when I met her. I met her when I was out there. When I came back, her family could not understand me. I had lived in Spur, Texas so long. <laughs> so you think I sound like a hillbilly now, Southern draw. Okay, you missed out on the my peak performance years and years ago. <laughs> 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 I've seen, <clears throat> excuse me, well, the PUA is just an accelerated base policy mm. because the cash value must equal, equal the face amount at age 120. We're just making that happen sooner with the PUA, justifying the 1090, hmm. right? So all we're doing like is- Like bringing the cash value closer to the death benefit. Sooner. Sooner. Yeah. Which, yes, that's actually what, I mean, yeah, that's what, exactly what that is. So can you make an argument for ninety gonna... because of that? Is, no, which is I mean, what that, they if, do. if you want that. But they leave it right The there argument for that is on. if you want that, go get that, right? The argument is if you want, you know, relatively inferior overall long-term cash value growth dynamics and death benefit and dividend growth dynamics too, if you want relatively inferior value growth dynamics on those three margins then go get that yeah but it's still that there it, it doesn't work out but i do appreciate that look and the, which leads me to a conversation that i had earlier with uh, jake this week you know and i think 1090 came up or something with the case he was working and 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 but we go through that <clears throat> you know in our process we go through the you know what we're doing why we're doing it and, and why it matters you know the way we do it okay um and people understand you know, unless they're trying to justify their own position, you know, or they've gotten off into the noise and can't knock it off of them and, you know, whatever, whatever. But this conversation ensued, and I said, well, I would just go to Canada as an alternative to the 1090. I would just go to Canada to buy a age 100 term, come back to the U.S., and then just buy tax-free muni bonds. Uh-huh. Right, I didn't educate my banker to win against the tax-free muni bonds. <laughs> oh, wait, I still brought in the third-party banker. I still had to bring them into the equation. Yeah. And this is becoming your own banker. Do you want to control the banking function in your life? Do you want to do it in the first year or every year <laughs> that you possibly can? <laughs> So, okay, thanks for letting me go down that road. No, that's, And I have no interest in going to Canada except for a, a pleasant visit to great. Quebec whenever there's – yeah, we're freely able to do that. Okay. Tell you what, I don't need to – y'all can have every last bit of that snow. I don't need any part of Canada. Um, I want to go in the summertime. I've been there once, and that was enough. <laughs> um, the companies don't explain it. it it's kind of like how some people get nervous asking about how people get paid. Um, U.S. dollars, <laughs> <laughs> digits, <laughs> relatively efficiently, actually. Um, but the same kind of vibe with the companies. The companies that 
going back to the audience capture thing, you know, wanting to please the agents, oh, attract the agents, recruit the agents, give them what they want so that they can give the people what they want or what they think they want. Uh, so you have the blind leading the blind leading the blind. Um, and the and ditch is full. But they won't, they won't just explain to – people don't ever want to say no. Right? There's this very uh, – I think of like the – uh, what's the what's the thing called where you shelter the mother shelters the small child and like protects the child from the world and he grows up to be a psychopath and kill everybody right like that kind of like protect people from no protect people from negativity protect people from like no the reality of the situation is that you don't get to have that because it doesn't work economically right or like to tell an agent like for a, I imagine like a home office person telling an agent like yeah you actually have to write a cover letter if like you have to know the person. I know it takes a while. You have to talk to them on the phone and stuff. You have to know who the person is, and you have to write that down, and you have to send it to the company so that we can have an idea of who the person is. They won't. Companies won't even do. that. I'm making a joke. They won't even do that, right? They put it. It's in their manuals and stuff. You have, but people don't do it, you know. And so the then the companies turn around and complain that they they have these hastily put together poorly justified applications. It's like, well, you never told the agent that he had to explain it and justify it. And so what do you, you're surprised. And so it's the same kind of thing with these contracts. It's like, okay, you want higher, quit higher number, bigger, faster, sooner, whatever the clever thing is that we came up with last time. You want that. I'll give that to you. Yes, yes, yes. Here. Yes. And if I'm still working at this company, when that falls apart, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> then we'll fix it. Then that, that would, require them to get over the anger of being led down the primrose path and it falling apart and then feeling like oh my gosh i've been duped i made a mistake i thought i was smarter than that i did everything you said right you know see it's not actually kind <clears throat> to not tell people you could just have what you want it'll be fine oh yeah good go do that it's and not I'll, actually, I'll do it for you here let me help you do this i'll help you yes yeah, we'll make it easy work. you don't have yes. to read Yes. Right? Yeah. Like the agent doesn't have to read the manuals, right? So when exactly, or write the cover letters so the underwriters don't have to read them. Nobody has to do anything, right? We just all go home. And we'll just send each other checks in the mail for the work <laughs> we don't do, right? Um, Wait, are you talking about agents or? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> sort of standard American workforce, though. No, no I'm kidding. Um, uh, uh, so surely, uh, surely so, you were talking about agents. <laughs> <laughs> so there's all the the. the all of that is happening in the background. And then the companies are surprised that the business doesn't do well. You know, oh, the, what I was saying, you're not doing anybody any favor. It's not kind. It's not helpful. You know, there's this idea in economics. I don't want to get off on an economic tangent, but you know, well, the, everybody else wants you the to state, oh. <laughs> the state funded professors talk about how, you know, yeah, <laughs> uh, like what, uh, that's probably mainly what we have, isn't it? I, I don't know. Well, well yes. They're, oh, yeah. wait, they're a professor at a college. Of course, that's what we have. Yeah. Okay. They're I don't want to lose my train of okay, thought. Okay. Sorry. But um, where was I going with that? Man. It's like the state funded college professor. I'm sorry, even. It's okay. It'll come there. back. It'll come back. But it's not kind. It's not kind to people to tell to, them to do that, to give them the policies because it's not going to work out. And it's exactly what you were talking about later. They're going to get down the road. Uh, premium won't be payable for as long as, the, as, long as they thought uh, it could. The idea of flexibility, okay, especially in the case of annually renewing term, which we've kind of just been assuming along the way throughout the conversation that annually renewing term is often involved in these 1090 type policies in order – so that the company can mitigate their death benefit exposure down the road, resulting in overall less paid out and overall less PUA premium, overall less cash value growth, right? But they get to give you that up front, right? To facilitate that sale, to get that paid. And they're giving you what you want, right? Like when people, I had somebody ask me this last week, you know, um, can we just, uh, you know, I've had a negative experience in the past with another cl another agent, and so when we go about it this time, I want to look at illustrations from different companies. Oh, and put everything on you, right? I mean, you know, we can we do that, right? We need to look at the. <clears throat> and I said, this was his first message to me, and I said, well, thank you for getting in touch. I really appreciate that. And if that's something you want, you should go find it because we're not going to do it here, right? And now I and you mentioned you had a negative experience, and I understand that. And oftentimes, and maybe this is the case now, maybe it's not. But what can happen is people can have relatively traumatic experiences elsewhere where the, it wasn't explained to them how should you go about selecting a company, right? The factors weren't even considered. Things were moved quickly. You were encouraged to sign and apply and 
take delivery so that the agent could get paid. And that was uncomfortable. And you had questions that they couldn't answer. And you didn't like that. I get it. I wouldn't okay. like it either. None of that's going to happen here. We're going to answer all the questions, but what we're not going to do is go do the illustration thing because those are apples to oranges. Well, how many questions right? will you answer if I have, you know, uh, like 1090 questions and then I have, if they're good, know, direct, like, if we're not valid recognition and if we're not validation seeking, <clears throat> can I ask those first up front without doing any kind of reading or understanding? Can I ask, can I wear you out on those oh, is what yeah. I'm asking. Can I drag you out into the wilderness and beat you to death? Because I want <laughs> you to support my preconceived ideas or misunderstandings or validate my opinion or my position. Right. Yeah. No. And, and, and no. <laughs> and this, this is another, this was another distinction that occurred to me too, because we often use the words agent and advisor interchangeably yeah. but it occurred to me that we should i should stop doing that right the agent the principal agent relationship is between the company and the salesman right the agent is an agent for the company right your people talk about their your life insurance agent no no that could be your advisor maybe it's really just who you bought the policy from right because the it's really the company's agent right we're and we don't have any control over that's so the way the licensure structure is done so we're agents of life insurance companies whether we like it or not right not agents of members of the public um so that's what an agent is just technically an advisor on the other hand or maybe in addition advises you know they actually have a perspective like something which implies exclusion right like if you have a specific perspective an advisory perspective an angle how you see the world you know, how you understand things, how you can situate things, make sense of things, find meaning. If that's what you're doing, you're going to exclude, you're going to say no to some things, right? If you have a long-term oriented, you know, relatively conservative type perspective, you're going to exclude the other type things. You're going to say no, right? As you would want, I would think, as I think people do think when they go see any kind of specialist for any kind of thing that they care about, that matters. They want to be told, I would think, I would want to be told no, if I was going down the wrong path, right? Or let's not use right or wrong. Let's say if I was mistakenly pursuing something that I thought aligned with my set of preferences along with, along my value set, that in fact was not, I would like to be told about that before I go buy something that it's going to cost me to get out of, right? Because if I surrender a contract early on, I lost money. If I surrendered it after there's a gain, there's a tax liability. Like I'd like to not do any of that. And it would be helpful to know up front. I mean, I have, we've had the marketing conversations about whether to put money behind whatever ads because, because not to be like, Ooh, marketing gurus, let's, you know, I want to go to the next 10 X conference, you know, uh, not that, but because we get the question so often or the comment so often from people, I have a policy in force. I had another advisor. I had questions for him, for her, whoever, and they just couldn't answer. Then they stopped picking up the phone. Then they stopped returning calls at all. Then they stopped answering the emails, right? Some, there's some variation of this, right? We've talked about orphans, refugees. We've talked about it before, right? And it's kind of frustrating. It's like, you see what went in force. He's like, I didn't know this, this, this. And oftentimes what's, it's not funny because this, this isn't funny, but it's ironic that by the time they get to me or to you, they can often articulate what was wrong with yes. what they did from the last agent yes. who didn't explain anything. Yeah. You know? And, and that, and it's so interesting how these things just go together. You know, just like non-direct recognition, long dated level term writer, substantial base premium, you know, slow, you know, just like brisket in Texas, slow and low for a long time, you know, <laughs> slow always works out better, right? Just like all those kind of things kind of hang together. All these other things kind of hang together. Annually renewing term, you know, you got to use the, the targeting of death benefit, you know, the relatively inflexible PUA riders, relatively limited catch-up provisions, relatively limited in general, right? Uh, direct Wonder recognition. Why. Yeah, all of these things kind of hang together, right? Mm -hmm. This is just my a suggestion for how to, con how to put these things in contrast with one another. I, th I just think that that approach is the captured approach. It's the approach of commodification. It's, I want this now. The numbers speak for themselves. 
bigger number is better. What do you mean? I've been told by Wall Street that financial analysis is finding the bigger number, and I'm not an idiot. That's a bigger number. Let's compare the illustrations. It's all just whole life. It's all basically the same, right? So let's compare those. And all the agents are basically the same too. I just need somebody who can, you know, and it's all a cost anyway, because life insurance salesmen are make commissions and people who make commissions are evil. So, you know, all of that goes into that type of thinking. And, it, which, and, and, then, no, and then everyone's surprised. The companies are surprised that it's impersistent. That I was going to turn around and take a loan. The, the, the basis of the sale... <laughs> was that you would turn around as soon as possible and take a maximum policy loan, right? That was the basis of the sale that the company accepted. Well, the understanding is I got to get it in first right. before I make that purchase, which I agree with. Which, yes, generally. again, half, just like always with the book, half true. Out of context. Half true and out of context. It's like, okay, and there's a whole path. That, it's, it's why those, those little half- truths are so frustrating is because to unwind them you got to go through like a whole explanation of like when does it make sense to route money through a policy to take a loan create indebtedness to the company to pay what you're going to pay for anyway like when when does that make sense as soon as possible yeah yeah of course <laughs> right but, but my my the one the thing i want to like the main theme that i want to come back to here is that the company what i have noticed over 6 years is that the companies struggle to say no or to correct agents and it's really on, you know you see it in all sorts of layers they won't cancel the damn contracts you know if you're if the, all of these contracts that the companies give to the agents have a specified persistency threshold of some amount and then they these companies go they do sell a lot and it becomes a big revenue source for the company. And so then they don't want to cancel the contract. But it says in there that if it's impersistent, the contract should be canceled. It's like rocking a hard place. Yeah. And then you're uncomfortable yeah. with that style of business, yeah. right? But you and wanted it. And then if it. it's not profitable for some time period, then why do they do it, right? Oh, I don't know. Maybe the home office employees are working for a pension and you know maybe they're on their way out. Maybe not. I mean, that's just one. I don't know. It's like I'm transitory between this life insurance company and that life insurance company. If I can get your numbers up now and go, mm. then you can deal with the aftermath. Mm. Oh, just like what's in the big wide world now with the refugees and orphans. Um, you know, if I can just get you in, I mean, I've literally heard agents out of their own mouth. I mean, physically there, there, and they say things like, uh, it won't matter. I won't be here oh, for the long God. term. Right? <laughs> I won't be here. It won't matter. Oh, service. Let's not even talk oh, about that. Please leave now. <laughs> I've, I'm telling you, I've <clears throat> maybe I've uh, increased in my grace as I uh, increase in age. I don't know. But literally, um, for a long time, and even every now and then currently, you know, I wonder why some of these life insurance companies ask me back, you know, because, I mean, I've grilled everyone that I've been with not grilled them just point blank ask them well why do you keep giving the gangsters contracts Oof. well and gee. then they squirm well, <laughs> yeah. well it's, it's good now yeah, so whatever so hey here's a possibility the rvp who has that conversation is commissioned are they Aren't they? I think some are. I don't know if they all are. I've there's, seen them come to company sponsored trips. They're <coughs> well, qualifying surely somehow. there's a surely there's a bonus commission structure in there, in addition to their guaranteed salaries. Make no mistake, the majority of their income is a guaranteed salary. Yeah. That's why they're there in a future guaranteed pension. If the company, and most companies don't even offer pensions today. Huh. Anyway, so uh, that I kind of, I kind of, yeah. Understand well, they're held why. to account for numbers too. You know, they've got to recruit so many agents. They've got to produce so much. They're busy revenue. They're hitting quotas. I get Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Getting. They're certainly not watching this podcast. They're not going to get all into these details, right? Talk about getting <laughs> overly technical. Um, it's like it, to my point here. Don't lose your train of thought. Like you know, I, I really like to retain till about the 15 or 20 minute mark something that really gets egregious to the home office or the individuals out there because you know they're not they listening won't hear it. Yeah. <laughs> and then when they do then my respect level goes up for them yeah well here's the they won't it's 
I think it's easier generally, this isn't about anybody in particular, but I think it's easier generally to keep cashing the checks, even if everything is doesn't square up nicely, because to, to, to tell people, hey, you should stop do that and maybe stop doing that and maybe consider doing this differently, that one is change. You don't want that. Uh, and two, the it's not as it's much more difficult. It's not of course. Here's the number. That number is bigger than the other number. Sign here. It's this number is lower than that number. Yeah, I get that, right? But here's why that still makes sense because it's not about. It's not always going to be that way, right? It's not like we purposely go to find a way to do worse. That's not the case. In fact, what the approach here is to do better in an optimal fashion to improve over time. As you get older, in an optimal way, right? With the full timeline in mind, right? With your full income generation career, let's say, and then late life passive cash flow, and then intergenerational transfer capital, intergenerational capital transfer to take all of that into consideration, right? Not just right now. No question. I mean, <clears throat> to me, uh, even if we take the inter intergenerational, multi generational, just looking at you whatever generation you are in, me, and, and looking at my life, my whole life, my whole time period that I'm walking around with my feet on the ground, my life. Most people won't when it comes to life insurance, especially the infinite banking concept, because, oh, I don't want the death benefit. I, I, I just want the cash. Well, go put money in the, in, in, in the bank. You know, go buy some uni bonds. It's like, yes, infinite banking. No, I eat, live, and breathe that in half for 20-something years ever since I discovered it. Right? I mean, but you can't jump over the fact that we're dealing and using dividend-paying whole life insurance policies issued by mutual companies. And I completely understand banking is absolutely a process. No question, it is not a product. But if we're going to practice banking over my whole lifetime, then my thinking does matter you know, long-term thinking does matter. It's so simple to me, and maybe it seems simple to me. Maybe I've oversimplified it for myself, and there's no disparagement. I'm just making a point that if I want something to serve me well over my lifetime, why would I quibble on a particular point or two that's ultimately going to harm me, even though I'm not, I don't have clarity on how, because the future is unknown, right? But just by construct, the probabilities of something going wrong skyrockets. Why wouldn't I want to avoid that? Or why would I want to push dealing with that later? Yeah. Five years, 10 years, 20 years when who knows if you're insurable or not? Oh, dang, we got to deal with that life insurance again. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> I get to go back through underwriting. How fun. You know, it, it is, and it's such a complicated, it is technical. The objection, like to my mind, the objection on this on the target death benefit thing, uh, with one year term, that you know, so policy is about to be sold. We have an idea of how much premium the client's going to pay. There's a certain structure to it. Part of the policy structure is a blended term PUA rider or just a one year term rider. Different variations for different ways companies do it. Uh, but then mechanically, practically, day to day. Given what you want to pay, and given our given the current experience of the company, you know we have this stream of dividends over time that we're going to illustrate on the page. Assuming you pay the premiums that are shown on the page, right? And then to preserve non mech status, we're going to observe those two things, right? We have our current experience in mind. We have the desired premium. You have the desired premiums you want to pay, and the policy structure in mind. And we're going to use one year term in that design to preserve the non max status, to increase death benefit, to keep it away from the cash value so that we can stay within those guidelines. And at the point of sale, basically, or pre-application, you know, at the before this policy goes in force, we're going to look at those figures every year out through the insurer's age of 121, right? And then this one-year term rider, uh, year to year is going to help us achieve a target death benefit, right? And there's really, there's two approaches. The first one though, is that's a good point. Good point to start is the idea of the target death benefit. The, you know, let's say we're going to in years, let's say one through seven, we're going to aim to have the same level target death benefit. That target total death benefit 
is going to be composed of different individual death benefits. There's the, in, there's the initial death benefit that's associated just with the base premium. There's that death benefit. Um, you're going to pay some PUA premium in the year. You told us how much you wanted to pay. That PUA premium is going to buy some death benefit in that year. And then at the end of the year, a dividend is going to get paid. And we're basing that off of what you told us you wanted the right to pay in premium and our own company experience, which will change. But that's the basis for that. No, the, for the calculation of that number, we're going to pay that dividend. That dividend is going to go to PUA. That PUA is going to affect the total death benefit. All right, so we got initial death benefit. We got death benefit from PUA out of your own pocket. There's PUA coming from a dividend at the end of the year. right? And then we're going to make sure that whatever death benefit we need over and above those death benefits in order to get the total death benefits sufficiently up and away from the cash value. The way we're going to get that temporary death benefit is with one year term, right? So there'll Perfect. be some death benefit for one year at your current attained age, right? It's one year's worth of death benefit and you're a certain age now. So we're going to base the pricing of that death benefit off of how old you are right now and your underwriting status right now. Uh, next year, that's going to change because you're going to be a year older. Right. And so the calculation is going to be rechanged. Now that's okay, right? We expect that because you're going to pay premium year to year over time. And the more you pay premium, especially PUA premium, you're going to buy more permanent death benefit, right? So each year as you pay more in total PUA premium, you're going to buy more permanent death benefit. And so we won't need so much temporary death benefit. And now look, you're going to pay, you will pay what's on the page because if you don't, well, one thing that could happen, this won't happen because you're going to pay the number on the page, but one thing that could happen is that if you don't pay the premium that's shown, like if you need flexibility or nothing goes perfectly, um, or you have a loan outstanding, right, and we're a direct or recognition company. Or the dividend's company, not what was illustrated. Oh, okay. So any number of things, mortality experience, any number of things Yeah, but, but mainly when it, when it comes to the to the consumer, the, the premium is not guaranteed to the life insurance company, the PUA. Exactly. Not yeah. guaranteed. And whether it goes up or down, and, and you're talking about the uh, effects of that. But then, oh, wait a minute, the dividend is not guaranteed either, but it's projected. So conceptually, the life insurance company has built, constructed the uh, mechanism in which all that can happen if all of these things are Occur. Yep. And so, uh, okay. And that's the whole, yep. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, something does change. What? I don't pay exactly the premium that was shown. Something well, had, listen, I, I something unexpected came up and, you know, I just didn't, I, I, can, can I catch it up, Ron? Uh, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> the catch up provisions are getting less and less generous all the time. You and I talked about that. The, yeah. the nature of the ability to go back, we call it a catch up provision yeah. to the PUA rider, the ability to go back and make up for PUA premium that you should have paid but didn't. Yeah. The, that ability at all these different companies looks different, but in general, it's all constricting. Yeah, but right? okay, so whatever happened, happened, and I didn't pay the premium. Again, all ways to manage liability of the company. So all those, yeah, so I didn't get that. I didn't get that. PUA paid on time, you know, so I didn't buy that death benefit, which didn't de generate that cash value, which means I deviated from what was originally illustrated, right? The less death benefit, my, my contribution, my part in this in contributing to that total death benefit is lower than what was assumed. And so now also, in addition, the dividend is also lower. So we have a secondary effect, lower P less PUA coming from the dividend. There's less PUA coming from me personally, because whatever happened once, this only has to happen once. Less PUA coming from me, so less PUA from the dividend, so less total death benefit. So now, well, what's the other death benefit component? The initial death benefit on the base premium is contractually fixed. I can't change that. No, that's not going to change. So it's how, premiums paid. Yeah. So how am I going to, oh, oh, the temporary. <laughs> oh, I'll pay more. How much more am I going to pay? Well, yeah, who's going to decide that? Age. <laughs> who's, yeah, oh, and I'm older. Oh, they've already decided that. Hmm, okay, mm. yeah. Yeah. Oh, and then what was the nature of that PUA rider, by the way? Because is there any use it or lose it provision? Like most companies, if uh, I don't pay the full PUA over time, they've got a way of making sure that the, I'm gonna that they're gonna lower that. Oh, new so in addition maximum. to the catch up provision, that, which is limited and getting tighter and tighter, if I lower the PUA premium in a given year or two, every company's a little different, but they all have a mechanism to the built in, right? So if I don't pay the PUA for one, two, or three years, whatever, just do one right now. But yes, because okay, they, they, cause, because my point is that the that the problem just having this happen once creates future problems later. What? Right? Because I'm shocked. Because again, look the 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 acquisition of permanent death benefit in year X doesn't matter, right? In whatever year this 
deviation from the perfection picture that was illustrated, whenever this deviation occurs, and it will occur, right? Maybe not because of you. You pay exactly the same premium, but the dividend scale changed, right? Something out of your control. Uh, anything goes wrong once, such that we need more extra temporary death benefit in that year. Okay, it's a, lo it's a logically necessary fact that that will also be the case in the following year. Because when the policy was originally illustrated and the amount of temporary death benefit was predetermined, pre-calculated, pre-estimated, targeted, right? And then you deviated. Well, that, that screws up all of the future planned accumulated death benefit what? and therefore affects the dividends, right? And so the, my point is that these problems compound, right? Now, are you going to find that anywhere in the marketing literature or in the commission state insurance commission approved spec sheet or from a home office person no you're not going to get any of that because none of that is technical specifics you know it's not a i can't look that up anywhere it's not in the manual right it, but it's if we just think through the logical implications of that <laughs> what's going what will happen what will happen is the individual will just stop that that Whatever mechanism the company has to throttle down the, the annually allowed PUA maximum will get triggered somehow. That mechanism will be triggered and the new maximum PUA will go down and the total amount of premium accepted in that policy will be less than what was originally expected and the total cash value and death benefit growth will be lower than what's on the page. And it really, I'm, it only has to happen in one year because it create everything. The fact that cash value... <clears throat> The fact that cash value growth is compounded uh -huh. changes the game. <clears throat> yeah, there's. I don't disagree with any of that. Um, it, if there's a deviation from the premium payment, which, as Nelson would say, it's the actions of the owner that have a greater bearing on the result than even the life insurance uh. company. Right, that's an example of that. And so maybe it only does happen one year. And there's a catch-up provision, you know, and I, I get back on track. Everything in the future has been affected, no question, because you didn't pay that that uh, PUA in that given year, right? In that given year, even though you went and made a catch-up. So it still may not break everything, right? But what if it happened two years? Or what if it happened two or three exactly. different times exactly. throughout the policy? Yes, let it keep right? happening. Oh, and then in the background, you know, we have the MEC testing going on. In, yeah. in in addition to the construct of the policy, right? Oh, so I got to keep paying a higher cost or a higher cost for death benefit, no question. But I have to keep paying for more than was originally intended, right? So I got to pay a, for more at a higher cost. Yeah. And then there's some time in the future uh, that the death benefit goes down. And then, oh my gosh. So let's, you know, all business in, in unequal capital flows, un, you know, I get it. So you build all the, the, the foundation with that in consideration. You put as many fail safes as you can, but then life shows up. You know, what is that? Uh, that boxer said, oh, everybody's a badass until they get punched, punched in the in face. face. Yeah. yeah. Tyson, okay. Yeah. And then, so. Everyone's a tough guy until you get punched in the mouth. Yeah. And. <laughs> I completely agree. But look, all of these blended PUAs are constructs of the life insurance industry. Pray tell, Ryan, did they ever, one time ever, mention the infinite banking concept to you? Other than lately, if they're trying to recruit people, oh, yeah, we're the best in the infinite banking. Oh. Look at what we did with the blended PUA. Yeah. Oh, banking. We have whole life. Yeah. Well, we do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course we do infinite banking. Yeah. 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 Of course we, we read. Yeah. The life insurance company constructed the blended PUAs. And knowing full well that it's an unbind Strasse, a unilateral contract. If you do this, me, the life insurance company, will do this. If you don't do that, then that ain't going to happen because you didn't do that. Oh. Right? <clears throat> but I built this beautiful blended PUA knowing full well that I'm going to build products that mitigate the risk at every opportunity against me. But we mm. we practice infinite banking, right? Um, yeah, that's all. That's what I want is somebody to build me an absolute, salute an institution, right? I want the life insurance company to come to me and say, "Yeah, we've heard about banking. Look at what we built for you." 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh my gosh. I just got 10 degrees warmer. <laughs> oh, something's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. And so part of this one, I encourage them not to hire gangsters. It's my word, gangsters. You know, people that don't do the right thing, right? Or they continually deliver, you know, long term poor results. Quit giving them a contract. You know, quit hiring them. They'd be okay. How about if you are a life insurance company listening? Just be a good mutual life insurance company. That's it. Nothing else. So not unsexy. one more thing. <laughs> not one more thing. Just be a good. Uh, but you might. It might help you to go into the archives if you have them and dig deep into your history and your heritage and get some of that on you <laughs> and embrace it and be like that. Yeah. Yeah. Just good old insurance, you know. <laughs> Pay a dividend. I don't want an index dividend. I don't want a uh, color purple that. dividend. I don't, I don't <laughs> want that. I don't want. No, no. Well, James, this gives you all the cash value up front. It's what you wanted. That's not what I wanted. I wanted a stable product and a company that can stand behind that stable product for maybe another hundred years in light mm. of the fascist government that we mm. have throwing out regulations every opportunity they have. So. If, yeah. if the company that I work with and work with more than one, I own every one that I encourage my clients to consider, if they're sitting on billions, I'm okay with that. <laughs> I don't want them to practice this FOMO. Oh, it's like, what are we going to do with all this capital and reserve? No, it's okay. We need to find some private equity guys to come oh. help us. <laughs> and pay them to come and look. Yeah. Yeah. I had love. I'm gonna push it all the way. You know, I was just, <laughs> okay. Just, yeah, let's keep going. Base only. I was talking to David Stearns once. I think it was at the end of the Bank of Life event last late last year, and we were just chatting. He's like, you know, the thing that probably stuck. I'm paraphrasing. He's like, the thing that probably sticks out to me the most is, you know, is the power of the base. You know, the base. Premium. David Stearns. Yeah, yeah. He's David like, one David thing Stearns. I've learned over time is that the base premium because he's well. He's at the point where if you're paying anything, it's only base premium, right? On most of those. He's got a lot of policies, but on a lot of those. Yeah, the newer ones still have PUA. Yeah, they had those have PUA, but, you know, you get to a point in general in these policies where you just pay base. And so this occurred to me, and I happened to, I think it was actually, an, it, it's a part of my policy, the actual utilization of the software, like building a contract, part of that, my sort of recipe or formula for doing it, there's one step in there where we illustrate a base only contract. Um, and one time I put in rather than the whole outlay or rather than just the base component of what we had decided with this particular client, I put the number in for the whole outlay. Just on, I wasn't paying attention and hit illustrate. And I was, you know, listening to music, scroll down and look at the various numbers, see what I need to do next. I'm like, oh, I, I put too high of a base premium in here. So I scrolled up the tabular detail. Now, this is a company from, this is a, you know, uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act 2020, took, took effect January 1, 2022. Companies, products, whole life policies now have an internal base rate that is not 4%. It's some number between 2 and 375 and companies can choose for a given product, which one they're gonna use, but you gotta choose one. This particular contract is on the very low end of the range. If you're on the which very- Which produces a higher cash value. Produces a higher cash value. And the reason for it, if you have a lower internal base rate, lower interest rate, basically, you're getting less death benefit per premium dollar than if the rate had been higher, all right? So if you have a higher rate, then future values are greater for a in given inflow. All right, so if the, if the rate's lower, then the death benefit's lower. Well, if the death benefit's lower on the same premium relative to what it could be otherwise, then those premium dollars are contributing more to surplus. All right, there's less cost coming out of those premium dollars, in essence, across that class, across that underwriting class, right? Um, and so if those, if those policies contribute more to surplus, then they should get paid higher dividends, and they do. And what? that PUA goes, by the way, no PUA expense charge. What? Right. Oh, and by the way, dividends- And no term? Paid no and, term? And no term. What? And dividends paid on base premium are higher than Wonder dividends why. paid on PUA oh, well, premium. You said why. Yeah. Huh, think that they're- Trade-off between liquidity and contractual guarantees, right? Uh, so you have all the all these layers. So you got down there, you, and you scroll back up. Scroll back up. Oh, looked at the numbers. Yeah, thank you. Looked at the numbers on the tabular detail, table of policy values, whatever you want to call it. 
cash values, death benefits, and dividends all the way out to age one twenty one. And I was looking at the way the cat at the cash value growth pattern, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> maybe I should be like, I've really, I think it's, it should be like a matter of practice mm -hmm. to just go generate comparable, like go through a whole advisory process just as we would, and then just for to compare, mm -hmm. look at the base only. Well, I think that's very powerful, yeah. very important because the consumer typically doesn't know. Right. You know, it's like, okay, these are infinite banking up properly structured, all of that verbiage, um, which is very broad language and that can have different, <laughs> very greatly yeah. different meanings depending on whose mouth those words are coming out of. Sure. No, it would be illustrative for sure just to have the yeah, comparison. Absolutely. Now, you don't get the flexibility with the PUA writer like you do at, at some companies, some more than others. Uh, but like you mentioned, no term, no decrease in death benefit in the future. I mean, basically, as resilient to mech status as you could get, right? Dividends would have to fly off of the planet, right? There'd have to be a mountain of PUA premium <coughs> coming unexpectedly from somewhere to cause yeah. cash value to get out of whack. Even then, the companies could change how they price death benefit, you know, compared to how much PUA comes from dividends. So it's... Not once you're that so, policy is enforced. You're so secure, you know, that... Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's no question. It's, it, no question. Then it's the time preference of liquidity. And the long-term power? I mean, the cash value... You see, it gets me that, is that these agents... Well, maybe uh, maybe they can read, and maybe they do read, and maybe even reread Nelson's book, which I highly encourage. Maybe they haven't watched his series. You know, maybe they never seen Nelson Nash in person when he talks about his 1959 state foreign mm -hmm. policy. Maybe they never looked at the graph. You know, I know it's out there and available. Everybody's spitting it around somewhere. And you look at the dividend. Mm-hmm. And you look that in 1950. I'm not talking about any illustration that's in here. I'm talking about his 1959 State Farm policy. Yes, State Farm is a great mutual company. They're a county mutual company. Yeah, they have their PNC company. Yes, they can write life insurance. Do they like the infinite bank concept? No, they do not like the infinite bank concept. Why? Because they don't want you to leverage their capital surplus. <laughs> okay. They have enough trouble insuring the, these dang cars. Oh, well, they just double the price and then don't take new ones. That helps. Okay, so my point here is that if you've seen Nelson's 1959 State Farm Policy. The charts are in Building Your Warehouse of Wealth, by the way. Yeah. And you look at the dividend. Well, pray tell, where is the dividend coming from? Hmm. It's a base policy. Mm hmm It's a base, straight, whole life straight policy. Straight base policy, yeah. Yeah, so it, it's staggering. Those dividends would not be equal. There would be a lesser dividend if there was any amount of PUA on there. Now, it had PUA for a place for the dividends to go. It didn't have a dynamic dividend where you could add additional PUA. Mm. Right? And so if you did one of those 75, 35s or 50, 50 or 60, 40 or 80, 90, as a matter of fact, the more PUA you would put on a policy – 1959 and it still stands today although there are a lot of things that have changed since 1959 and today in the life insurance world and finance and interest i get all that i'm talking about the premium allocation between p way and base premium those dividends would not be near as great mm -hmm. as they were with any amount of p way premium being paid and the greater the PUA being paid, the greater effect, the greater disparity, the lesser the dividend would have been paid. Yeah. I mean, it's... The word momentum comes to mind. Like when you use PUA and term writers and whatever you're going to use, limited pay contracts, however you're going to do it to cause this manufactured large cash value as early as possible, whatever you're going to do to do that. It, it, it's as if you're like confiscating future momentum and using it right now. It's like crack cocaine. Because otherwise, <laughs> like ha, had, yes. had you planned for a, a longer term, built a contractual structure that allowed you to pay a higher premium for a longer time in a non-MEC fashion, that momentum would be lower earlier meaning cash value growth wouldn't accelerate so fast, but you lose out on this buildup of momentum that occurs over time. And the, the question is really just a matter of empirics. Like, 
at, at what point would it be that a base only or a larger base policy overcomes in terms of cash value, death benefits and dividends, some sort of structured quote unquote banking style. Policy. It's just a matter of when, yeah. you know, maybe in your case, you're old enough or the premium is low enough or whatever. So that that point doesn't happen for, you know, until you're a hundred and well, until the policy, maybe it never happens. It would happen after age 121, right? Yeah. That could happen, but it could also be the case that that shift in, you'd be a lot, you around and kicking, you know, in this, in your 50s, 60s, 70s, I don't know, some later age where on the banking, quote unquote, banking type contract where you've got a PUA writer, you got a term writer, term writer falls off, PUA writer is no longer, or PUA writer premium is no longer payable. All that is payable is the relatively smaller base. So your total premiums are now lower, right? You compare that to a policy where the, it's all a substantial base premium. So it remains payable. You know, it's just, it is a matter of time before that yeah. contract takes over. And so for somebody who, you didn't talk about like counterculture or really like going against the grain here. If someone's really thinking long term and they're thinking of strategic asset acquisition and, you know, generation of incoming cash flow over their working lifetime such that they're going to have incoming cash flow late in life, which in my opinion is what people should be doing, you know, thinking in terms of anyway, because the idea that there's going to be some sort of social security or, you know, government money maybe it's the case i i think planning on it is silly but uh relying on it relying on it silly yeah uh whether they, it exists or not in the future right if it does great bonus you know you get a tax refund 40 years later whatever but uh if you have that kind of perspective and and you're you're doing things now in order to accommodate that cash flow in the future i mean you can't the only way to do it basically is with a substantial base only contract Right. I'm surprised they'll give me 20 year term routers today. <laughs> I say that, I mean, I'm not surprised, but um, I completely agree with that. It's like, what do you want to do? You know, what is, what is your statistical life expectancy? What do you think your actual life expectancy is? And not that you have to know these things. I know I've been in the life insurance business long enough, way back in the day. And I'm talking to a client early on and <clears throat> you know what I, and we we're talking about life, right? We're talking about life insurance and all of that. And, you know, if one of them would have told me, said, well, James, I don't think I'm going to make 75. And I'm, and these are not 30-year-old people. These are mature people. Well, James, I don't think I'm going to make 85. Uh, and I'm talking about older, mature people, right, That the, the kind of people you'd want to hang out with and do business with. And, you know, dang near 100% of them would write, you know, if they hmm. said, I don't think I'm going to make this age. Hmm. You know, so I'd rather do this or that, you know. Or, they're right. Yeah, whether you think you can or can't. They right. were more right. That, yeah. than, so, <clears throat> you know, who knows what, I mean, I get it, lot, statistical life expectancy. I, I encounter that idea of like, I'm not going to need that. I don't need that much. I don't, I don't, I live humble, which all fair. I'm not, I don't, mad about any of that, you know, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. living frugally and all that. Great. And you're not going to change the way you live when you retire. Mm -hmm. change the way you go into passive income time you're not going to change yeah take a pay cut yeah. yeah i mean you're i mean if you've been a saver your whole life you're not automatically just turn into a sprint spinter and give your children or whomever all a bunch of money now, i'm not saying you can't get scammed or whatever but you're not going to change the way you live that's exactly what i mean and maybe this is just kind of a bourgeois attitude but the idea that i'm going to get older and like be in a lower tax bracket because i'm going to have less income each year it's like I think Why it, is that attractive to anybody? I think the general public has really already thought through that, uh. <clears throat> except for the, the 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 staunch, you know, Dave Ramsey, Susie Orman uh, followers. Uh -huh. You know, they 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 justify, so they have a narrative. They bought into that narrative, and so they're going to justify that thing. narrative. Yeah, it's yeah. part of the, you know, the. Stockholm syndrome type thing, you know. It's like I'm gonna I'm gonna call this guy who's very abusive and makes fun of people, and and I'm like I want to yeah, please abuse me. It's like what, you know? I'm just saying, then, and then praise him for it, you know. Yeah. But it's like oh yeah, self insure. Really, just I mean, it's coming out of your mouth. Go ahead and think that through. It's so it's so funny. It's kind of like a uh, the idea of a zero sum game. Uh, you know, I, I, someone's got to lose in order for someone to win. You know, I need to take a beating in order to come out 
ahead. You know, I need to yeah. get some punishment rather than rather than just something that's mutually beneficial and like and smooth and, and pleasant. Maybe pleasant, yeah. yeah. And even though it can be difficult from time to time, but it's the it's pleasant, right? Oh my gosh, yeah, congenial. I mean, I was thinking oh. about this like because there's such a wide, dramatic variety between the type of people who call and. It's like sometimes the calls are great and other times it's like, wow, I'm never getting that time back. You know, it's like, what, how, what's the difference? And it's not age. It's not income. It's not premium. It's not, it's none of those things. And people talk about demographic. It's like there's people who do this marketing stuff. And it's like, tell me about your demographic. Like, what are you talking about a demographic? <laughs> I'm talking about people who know, who understand that the letters I, B, and C are not just numbers or letters on a keyboard. You know, a demographic that doesn't that doesn't come with a skin color or a profession or an age range. No, no, it's about ideas. So there's no demographic. You know, but they're in the right demographic. <laughs> like, what? Yeah, no, yeah. and it and it comes down to smoothness, right? Like, which calls are smooth? Which ones feel light, <clears throat> um, joyful? Even you know, I was it's thinking about that the calls. other day. Not not necessarily just in client calls or prospective client calls, but it, it applies. Right. Which ones just suck energy out of you? You know, it's always the validation seeking for me. Yeah. And then it, and it's which ones are, they are pleasant. They are, there's a pleasant exchange of even ideas and, yep. you know, experiences, what have you. And, and, and then the ones that just suck energy. And I'm, I mean, I'm, I got, I got, I got, I don't have too much energy. You know, I don't need any energy sucked out of me. You know, it's like, then it's like, do, do you, you know, it's, it's uh, well, uh, you got to be a little weird in my opinion. You know, our best clients are a little weird and all of our clients I think are a little weird. I think I'm a little weird and got to have a little weirdness and, but genuineness. And I, you know, the, the pleasant call, people don't want to suck energy out of you. The type of person that I'm talking about, mm. right? So there's a type that does. I mean, they're vampires. Yes. Uh, you know, look. <laughs> yeah, but these myths exist for a reason. Yeah. I have a lot of people tagged on as vampire on my cell phone. Huh. You know what? They're mostly associated with the financial industry. Mm -hmm. Every one of them are. <laughs> I mean, I hate to say it there. I'm not kidding. I do I not know. have a single client that has vampire on. <laughs> not one. They're all, a, they're all associated with, not just in the life insurance, they're all associated with the financial industry. And it's like, my gosh, man. Uh, so I don't have enough energy to, you know, uh, engage with vampires. I'll go get blood, but don't like take it from me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, don't drag me out into the woods and you know bleed me yeah the, the last thing i want to say on this base stuff is you know nelson talked about the business of banking it's a business you're getting into the business he's got the whole section on what it actually takes to go get a bank charter what it did at the time and mm -hmm. tells all the stories involved there and it's like that's all that infrastructure cost of establishing a legal institution that operates in the and credit in line. yeah it's like oh okay 10 years and, millions and of dollars, pony whatever. up a bunch of money that exchanges hands under the table yeah there's startup costs absolutely and we don't escape that we dramatically minimize them and reduce them it, yeah. compared to all of what it would take to go start an actual bank but you don't get away from them entirely and you shouldn't want to and it's so like, anybody who's in business knows this like you don't know, when you're starting to get in business it's like What's the shortcut? How do I do this? I want to be successful long term in business. So how do I take the shortest possible, quickest, you know, fastest turnaround type activity? How do I do that now? It's like no one thinks that way. No business person thinks that way. Well, everybody all in the business thinks that way. Online uh, sales promoters, that's you're you're like reading their script, Gigi. Yeah, but look, the, you get the you get the credit cycle in here, and then people can live off free money and debt for a long time, and those people stick around for a lot longer than they should. Yes, and I think there's a lot. That's one cultural effect of legalized counterfeiting is bad actors can suck up that 
newly manufactured money and persist around the rest of us for longer than they otherwise would in a legitimate market, a legitimate money market. Um, anyway, all of that is to say you don't have to participate in any of that. Uh, I don't know how we got off on this whole thing, but it has been a number of different ways, like different, like the idea that it's just bad business. I don't know, I don't know why that was such a, uh, to me, but, and then just now, though, though, if, if each one of those policies is, is a little business branch of someone's banking system, mm -hmm. to say that that kind of business is impersistent is just to say that a lot of those businesses fail, or a lot of those policies fail, and they do. And be, because it there's cost you to start up, it's going to cost you to fail. It's going to cost you to recover. It's going to cost you to reformulate. It's going <laughs> to there. It's nothing but cost. Yeah. And then it's and so I've had I say it all the time um, because I believe it's true. Right. No business mm -hmm. is better than bad business. It period. Think that through. Yeah. It is. It's so I like simplicity. I mean, I believe it's a virtue. Um, that short-term thinking is going to get you an education quicker. There's no shortcuts. <laughs> there are direct paths, right? Uh, but there are no shortcuts. There's no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts. And it's like, wait a minute. Let me hear that. I understand <laughs> that. And now I'm okay with that. Show me the correct path, the direct path. It may be the shortest path, but it's not a shortcut. Mm -hmm. I'm not not missing out on things that I've deemed are not important or I've identified yeah. as unnecessary requirements. So we just go around them. Mm -hmm. No, no. A direct path. If you want to practice the infinite banking concept in the most direct path for you, just call. Right. <laughs> I'm telling you. Well, this is a good place to start. Right. This one's worn out. That's one of many, sir. It's like there's not even that many markings in there. I just got a new case of them in. Okay, what else, Mr. Griggs? I know I'm surely you're hungry. I mean, you know, you haven't. That's probably a good idea. Yeah, I mean, audience capture. You know, the, the agents we, captured by the We didn't really get into and that. The companies captured by the agents. Yeah, we didn't really get into the audience capture. It's going to be an ongoing theme because I oh, think yeah. it's so <laughs> fitting. Yeah, because a lot of the time, I don't think, I really think everyone's trying their best, doing their best. Sure, you know these the agents they they want to do well for themselves and for their family. And you know this is look ten ninety type people don't like disagreements. They get they get uncomfortable with it. You say you don't like something, you think that I'm condemning all of them. It's like that's not the case. I mean these people are all great. It's a professional disagreement. I don't think that approach to policy design is going to serve people in the way that it could and i think there's a better way to do it yeah you know that's all um but they're not malicious some of so now hmm. <laughs> like, wait, you know just yeah if we're just Please strictly going to talk about 1090 or 60 40 or 70 30, whatever yeah i don't, I don't want to blow smoke up anybody's skirt no, there because, are malicious people in every industry right there are plenty of uh vampires and yeah so know, if i'm gonna if i'm gonna stuff. like on whatever point that i want to you know capture myself and capture the audience capture my victim you know and and i see it a lot in 1090 i also see it a lot in universal life right index universal life I can't believe that hasn't come up i mean that's an annually renewing term is the freaking death benefit component of a universal life contract yeah. Can you just keep your universal life contract on your side of the table? You know, no. Then they'll bring IBC into it, and then it's like, oh, well, you don't understand, you don't properly. But then they'll use third party software to manipulate the numbers, manipulate in a bad way. So, are they all gangsters out there? Of course not. Um, philosophically, you know, can we disagree on some things? Yes, no question. Um, even on a matter of principle and we can disagree and professionally and then there's some every now and then if they have demonstrated themselves to be manipulative mm. i'm not even interested in the conversation to get to a disagreement mm. thank you 
Just yeah. my opinion. I know there's someone out there. This applies to somebody, and this is free for you, right? <laughs> but the lang- there's language you can use with advisors you may – advisors, I'm sorry, agents you may be engaged with who you discover have a f- difference of philosophical view. I've decided to go another direction. That's it. You well, know, I- sometimes people think that they've got a – provide an explanation or a justification you know and treat others as you like to be treated i don't love getting ghosted but it happens so i don't ghost people but um it's it's okay hey look i've decided to go another direction thank you for all of your time yeah no question it's like is not only that you know ryan i've decided to go another direction i really appreciate everything that you've done for me it's helped me greatly and i expect you to respect my decision oof and it's that simple, very mm-hmm. straightforward. And then it's like, what I do? Don't you love me anymore? And I never loved you in the beginning. I liked you enough <laughs> to engage with you. I'm kidding. <laughs> Look, there goes James and Ryan telling people how to fire their agent. Um, Why don't you get a bunch of calls next week? Brian, I've decided to go a different direction. <laughs> <laughs> no, hey, it doesn't have to be. You don't, gotta, you don't have to come become my client. You know, But the people I've talked to. Who have been put through the ringer? Uh, yeah, it would have been. I, I would imagine that they wouldn't have minded if somebody would have come up and said to them, "No, no, it's okay. The concerns you have are legitimate. You may not have all the wording for it. Here's what you can do to just create some space and give yourself some time." And what? Create that, some space. Don't jump over it. Yeah. And give yourself some time. You are worth that. Whomever you are, whatever decision. Give yourself some space. Yeah, people need to hear that. Yes. And you're allowed some time, right? You don't have oh to hurry gosh. because products are getting changed or because have a birthday. You know, there's a deal you're missing or act fast. Like all of that, you know, we were at the suit shop that one day and the guy who makes the suits is like, you know, we can rush order you something. And I'm like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not able to do any Why rushing. You, you know, you're rubbing salt in the wind. I bought a nice overpriced suit that the guy, the clothier just needs to quit. <laughs> excuse me yeah it's like okay if it, yeah no mad props to you he's like yeah i'm not interested but <clears throat> yeah no rushing you know yeah. and i've had for whatever reason of the uh, uh, more than normal for this time of year people who've come in there have been a number who have had this maybe that's why it's on my mind uh i have this policy from so-and-so agent and then the, it's a fallout story oh yeah you know um, <laughs> yeah. those are regular look the last one that i've had uh engaged learned a lot right down the road of application and and then the discovery hence in the beginning of the conversation you know paying for google ads or whatever for only one reason would i ever pay for advertising in google ads is to let people know who i am what i do and why it may why it may matter you know who we are what we do and why it matters right so we may be discovered sooner than later engaging with these types of people that we're discussing yeah okay i'd strip that puppy down i'm just tired of hearing it <laughs> yeah well the, the the last one it's like you know the 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 advisor just browbeat the fire out of them whining and crying and where are you going they should pay me Oh, this one. Obligating, you know, trying to feel make the client feel like they're op- they owe them something. You know, we did all of this for you. We did all of this. Well, nobody forced you to do all of that. Yeah, guilt trip. Right? Oh, guilt trip and yeah. beyond. Oh, terribly. Count money you ain't made and feeling entitled the whole yeah, way. Yeah, and I just, I remember, yeah, so many things that come up. And it's just <laughs> like, you know what? How about you be a big boy and, and go and prove your self yeah right but you're gonna beat the client up to just orphan them later I'm like, oh my gosh yeah hey. anyway yeah how much of that do you and want? chasing a check that ain't even been written i mean you're telling people your opportunity costs you're telling people it's like if you don't have the next best thing to go do if you're not busy you know you're just sitting here dwelling you're gonna spend all this time dwelling to pinch after something that ain't coming this kind of tells you the, va- the value you're putting on your own time Right. Mm. 
Yeah. I, they price it, not me. <laughs> okay, I, I I had fun, you know, and, and you know went long. So. I do. I'm sure it goes too long. It's long for all the comments. No, we'll break it's, it up in five segments. You know, yeah. part one, two, three, four, and five. So, like, there was a comment earlier. You read a a comment earlier about Mike and Lori's part. Yeah. People love the get. I mean, the, they'll accept the long form when it's with guests with me. I'm the, I'm the bad influence. What else? Uh, oh, yeah. uh, I'm too slow. Adam on. Whatever. I know I go deeper technical, whatever to, I, I know there's all sorts of the accusations, you know, and, uh, uh, Oh, majoring in the minors. There's a lot of that, right? I major in the minors. I've heard that accusation. Uh, and Is I know, this on, and I know others make the accusation and they tell it to other people and those people then tell me. That's yeah, yeah. how I found out about it. But. Do, you, do you major in the minors with economics or can they even spell that word? <laughs> I'm just asking. I mean, I don't are, know what you mean, they... but I get that a lot. You know, um, oh, I know. Uh, yeah. Premium design, premium splits. People think talking oh, about premium structures, bad bad words, 30, 70, yeah, yeah. 40, 60. 50, You're getting 50, lost 90. in the weeds. It's, it's, a, it's a process, not a product. And it's like, yes. yeah, all, that, all of that is very true, right? More it, half. But how long do you want a stable banking system the first time? That's a fair question. How long do you want a stable banking system? And do you want it the first time? I spent a year and a half looking for and finally getting the car I have now. And I'm very happy with it. I'm very pleased that it. Thank know, God. It, by the way, it took what it took. You yeah. Know? Um, that for a car. You know, the premium that he the, didn't even buy. <laughs> <laughs> no. But, the, you know, I did I major in the minors there when I'm quibbling about, you know, the ride quality or the feel, the texture of the material? I would only say yes because of the brand you started with. OK, but OK, uh, well, I got there eventually. I mean, sometimes you got to go to the the devil is in the freaking details really and so is. when and i get i it's a paradox because i love how you put it if you don't understand the concept the details don't matter and if you understand the concept then the details don't matter and i get that but the devil's in the details and so when the people say oh it's a banking is a process not a product stop talking about premium splits yeah. Yeah, yeah. uh and you're telling me what questions i can and can't ask it's like i'm already i'm already out yeah i'm already out and I, th I wish, I would hope, my hope for people is to be less tolerant in that way, right? Like, have a little gut feeling reaction and a little trust in yourself. A lot of the time, people, the Stockholm Syndrome thing of blame myself, what am I getting wrong? Oh, I just don't understand. The level of that attitude in finance is wild. Off the charts. And the... Yeah. You know, for somebody who really doesn't like the bullying or the, you know, picking on people like that, it it bothers me. It really bothers me. And then you hear about it and then it's like, oh, I. so if you're somebody who hears me talking about that, it might sound irrelevant to you because maybe I haven't, you haven't gone through it. Although a lot of people have had negative interactions with people of the financial services community. So that's not the case. But those who may object to my approach or to this kind of, topic for this material they maybe just can't relate you know imagine if it was you you know you, the part of this too is the percentage of annually incoming cash flow that's used as premium is substantial i mean you're doing a big thing now maybe you're not maybe you go through some other you know i assume a lot when i talk about these things maybe you go through some other process and they're telling you where you can go find the money and yeah you know i, I do agree with you I, I agree with every bit of that and i'm just thinking if back in the day you know, when I wanted to, when I when I was exposed to the idea of the infinite banking concept, man, I wanted to learn. And thank goodness for me, because I'm a slow learner, that the all of the noise wasn't out there. There was a bunch of noise, and and they're still involved in the noise today with IULs. You know, and they you know, all you got to do is type their name in there, and criminal search history, and all that shows up. You know, it's just, and I'm not disparaging them. I'm just talking facts. Okay. Um, but I, there were other books available, right? other talks, other speakers, and, and they all had their books, right? Well, this is what intrigued me out of all of the speakers, and I'm so thankful that I didn't have to go through all of that other noise, and social media wasn't like it is today, that I read this. I went, yeah. I, I say I went straight there. It took me, you know, I bought it, and it took me a while to read it and all that. You know, my, my story is out there, and it's like... 
I'm so thankful. And then I had the opportunity to spend the amount of time that I did with Nelson. I mean, I think me, I needed that because of my slow self mm-hmm. and learning. And I'm today, today, <clears throat> excuse me, I believe that people, um, and, and I've said this many times, just the idea of doing a podcast, it's not promoted, we don't have advertising, we just sit, we come down here in the middle of a weekend, taking our time, and I'm not a bleeding heart, you know, I'm not looking for sympathy, I'm just saying, when you originally put yourself out in the big wide world, you know, it's like, take some cojones, it did for me, it's like, you know, you're going to hear all the bad comments or do whatever the negative stuff that occurs and i'm like i wish that was available for me back in the day on one Mm -hmm. hand but i'm glad the noise wasn't as prevalent you know it's not it maybe it was as prevalent but it's not so readily available yeah then yeah and the, the the noise signal thing is a good dichotomy like i think in the past in nelson's day the likelihood that you would encounter the signal was lower, yeah. but if you tapped in, then you you were at the source because he yeah. was the only one talking about it. Nowadays, there's way more noise. Yeah. It drowns out the signal, but there's more signal too. Like the, the likelihood that you do encounter something related to IBC is greater now. Yes. Right? But the path from initial exposure to the core truth of it, right, Nelson? That is much fuzzier and less direct. Yes, than it absolutely. Used to be in the past. I would like to think today, as slow as I am, <clears throat> that I, uh, you know, I, I'm, I think I believe we're all biased. You know, we all have our own individual experiences, and and I really and I have always enjoyed the individual who can just sort the BS. Mm-hmm. You know, I can just sort that. You know. Um, whomever you are, and I think most of the listeners here can do that, and I think that that's why we have the type of clients that we have because mm-hmm. they can sift right through the BS. Now, there's all different levels. You know, somebody might want to go long form. Maybe someone would like to, you know, Ryan, J- James, can you just be less nuanced? Ryan, could you be less nuanced? Just get right to the point. You know, there's some of that, but um, but I'm okay with that. If you want to learn the truth and you want the direct path to the infinite banking concept for you correctly, I think that this is a part of it. This is part of that. Yeah. You know, and I would like to think that today, if the circumstances were changed from then to now, that I would have the ability to sort through the noise mm-hmm. and, and find the one that has a nuance. If I want to learn something, I don't want to just kind of know it. If we're talking about yeah. big money, yeah. big money, whatever level amount, if we're talking about something that that is substantial money, and I'm going to count on a long time period, you know, it's not like I'm going to go buy a tractor and pay 25 grand for it or, you know, 250000 whatever. It's not like I'm going to go buy a car, I'm going to wear it out in seven years and 10 mm-hmm. years and move on. If, if it's long term, right? I think I would tolerate some nuance. I would personally enjoy it. <laughs> Seek it out. Yeah. Yes. Demand it. Yeah. Yes. And be better for it. Yeah. Okay. Heck, I'm getting hungry. I could tell. <laughs> <laughs> Look, this guy, this, you know what? You know how much oxygen it takes to move a mass like this? <laughs> <laughs> you know how much protein and carbohydrates to keep it going? It's like, my gosh, man. For those who are listening, he's pointing at me, by the way. <laughs> he's not talking about himself. No. Well, I really, on the on the being robust, I'm a little robust. You know, it takes a lot of oxygen to move this mass. And that, well, listen, on a good day, I'm still preferred. It's all good. Oh, well, I was super My prepared at your age. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. No, don't, underwriting status is not that important. No, I'm kidding. It's really not. It's standard and all base. I don't care. Oops. That's... I'm just for me at my at my position in life where I'm at in life. It's really I don't care about the cash value. It's the perm. It's the death benefit at natural mortality. I've got a ton of policies. I mean, and and some are jank. You can't believe how some jank some of these are, right? Direct recognition, a company that won't even pay a dividend. You know, stupid, skinny base policies because it's my responsibility. I wrote the check for them. I allowed other people to drag me down that path before I'm like, no. 
anyway, so, but it's my fault. And so I'm just saying today, uh, at my place in life, at my great age of 60, it's it's death benefit. I could care less about the cash value because I know what cash value does over time. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that thanks for letting me share. Okay. Bye, y'all. Thank you for joining us on the Banking with Life podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe and click on that little notification bell. Otherwise, join us on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher for weekly content.